many of you have been asking me how do I get my Olympus cameras to talk to the ASI Air? Well, the answer is I actually don't, okay? Unfortunately, there's no way to connect the two. And I've emailed ZW about this and they actually have a lot of the Olympus cameras in their queue to add to a supported list for this thing. But you know, it, it may take a while, who knows? I've been waiting for about six months now. <laughs> now, but I do actually get this to work, okay? And I'll tell you how I get it to work. It's, it's not that difficult. Basically, I have this guy here. This is my guide camera, okay? And the ZWO ASI Air does all of the guiding and the tracking. And this camera right here, usually I have taking pictures in mono narrowband, okay? And with this guy, I have it set up to dither. And what dithering does is it moves the, the camera around on the sky and it eliminates what we call pattern noise. And pattern noise is very difficult, actually impossible to get rid of with calibration frames. It's that last type of noise out there. And dithering, for this reason, you know, it allows us basically to smear this type of noise out. And it's so important, in fact, that in astrophotography, we have a saying, dither or die. Okay, now unfortunately, I can't sync this camera with this one right now. So basically what I do is I throw out some frames. That's all there is to it. You know, I have a very aggressive dither on this guy's setup. I think it's five pixels for this little camera right here, which means it's moving it across this guy by a pretty significant amount. And that's basically how I did there. And, and it, has, it has actually worked fantastic for me. And I have actually gotten some great pictures out of it, even though they're not synced. And I, I don't dither every single frame. That's probably one of the other keys to my success with the system is that with this camera, I only dither every three shots. Okay, so that means about every single 15 minutes, this guy will move, okay? And the one-shot color camera, because it's a one-shot color camera, typically I'm taking shorter exposures because of the light pollution. Uh, that means that I, I typically can get about almost 10 frames and if I'm doing really long exposures I'll get five or six frames before I lose a frame. So yeah, I go out and I take 60, 70 frames of an object and I throw out maybe 20 at most, okay? Not a big deal. But it's totally worth it for me to throw out some frames versus trying to keep every single one and dithering because that allows me to take really awesome pictures using my Olympus camera. And, and this right here, by the way, is kind of my setup. This is a Skywatcher 80 millimeter ED, and I'll do a review on this here soon. I've got a much heavier duty focuser on here because of the weight of the cameras and everything. Typically, my camera of choice is the E1X because it has the least amount of thermal noise. Uh, right now, I've got the EM1 Mark II on here. All right, so here we are. This is actually, we're at night now. The moon has just set. Why am I whispering? There's nobody out here. This is an unsupported camera. It does not work with the ASI Air Plus Pro or the original period because it's not supported yet. And this is basically how I get this kind of rig to basically set up. So as an overall to the entire setup, right, let's turn it this way so you can kind of see everything. This is a ZWO T90MM Mini, okay? And I've got the ASI Air Plus up here which is connected to that. And then I have their autofocuser down here, which is how I'm going to basically control focus with this. Having an autofocuser, I mean, even though it can't do the routine through the ASI Air Plus, it's still really nice because I can basically control it remotely with the Batnuff mask on the thing. And I don't have to touch the stuff and it doesn't vibrate on me. It really makes reading focus a lot easier. And then this is my E1X and then I'm using an intervalometer because I'm going to do four minute exposures with this. So I've come up here, this is the, the main imaging camera system. I basically selected the ASI Mini and you do have to change the focal length, make sure the focal length is correct for that guide scope which is 120 millimeters in this case. And we'll do medium sensitivity and then we're going to hit play basically here on our polar alignment routine and it's going to basically do the plate solve and then I'll tell you next and it's going to rotate this thing about 90 degrees here which you can see it's already doing it so it's calculated hit let's go and looks like I'm just a little bit low 
not a little bit low, like seven arc seconds. I'm hitting the refresh here and basically just gonna up the head a little bit. Ah, oh, there we go, that's perfect. We're at like a total error of like 28 seconds. So now, once that's done, I'm gonna do preview here and we're gonna go to like a really bright star, okay? I'm gonna pick the first bright one that comes up that the graph is showing is nice and high in the sky. We're gonna go there. And we're gonna take this guy right here. This is a Batnoff mask. That's gonna go in the front of the scope like so. And I've got my LCD screen flipped out. We're in bulb mode with the E1X, which gives me a pretty bright preview. And magnifying, you can see here we're, we're quite a ways out of focus. I'm gonna start going backwards. That's, that's the wrong way. Let's go forward with electronic focus here. You can see our six spikes are forming. And we just gotta get the center two lined up with the outer four. Right there. Ah, this is so much easier than trying to touch it and it moves around on you. So at this point, what I'll probably do is um, I'm gonna pick an object and we're going to use the guide camera once again. It's basically our, our imaging camera, so to speak, for now. That we're gonna do the plate solving and this thing will actually point to the object. And because the guide camera is not pointing the exact same part of the sky, we'll probably have to reposition it a little bit. But this gets us very close because they're, they're pointed pretty close to the same section of the sky. So let's go back to tonight's best and we are gonna pick I'm gonna pick the Flame Nebula, which is something I've already done some work on. Now, once I get it framed up, basically by kind of jogging it around a little bit, then I would start, then I would switch this thing around and I would change the main imaging camera into the guide camera. And from there, this is where you need to basically trick the ASI Air into thinking that it's taking pictures. And usually what I, I do it on this rig here, I have, Another camera that's set up, I might even be just taking darks while it's doing, going on. Just put the lens cap on the telescope or I'll, I'll do oxygen 3 or something like that. But anyways, this guy will take pictures and every five or frames or so, it will basically uh, dither. And what that means is that the other imaging camera, the E1X here, will get dithered. So we found our object, we've got it centered up and everything. And now we've switched this camera to be being basically the guide camera. And this right here, this is just another uh, guide camera that I have. This is an MM120, it's one of the cheapest ones. So I plug this into the ASI Air Plus and I tell this to be the main camera and it's just gonna take darks is all it's going to do. Uh, well, it's gonna take darks as in there's nothing that's really gonna be recorded. But that basically is going to allow the ASI Air Plus to think that it could dither, it'll move things around because the dithering is all done by the guide camera and not actually the imaging camera. That's what basically dictates how far it moves uh, to make its random pattern, so to speak, to get rid of uh, pattern noises. All right, so we've removed the batten off mask from the telescope and now what we're gonna do, <clears throat> we're gonna do our switcheroo game here. We're gonna t turn off what the ASI thinks is the main imaging camera Change that to the 120 that I have attached. Turn that on. I go down here to the guide camera and use the, the 290mm, which is our guide camera. And then I'll show you here, here's my dither settings. So we're doing a five pixel dither every three frames. And what that'll do is that, that should give you enough subs that you know there aren't too many that are messed up. And then we can actually go back here to auto run. Uh, we gotta turn on the guiding. And then here in auto run, about 30 frames, 300 seconds. And just hit play once the guiding starts. I'm gonna confirm that we'll shut it down once we're done. And then it will start imaging and guiding and dithering all for you. So I wanna leave you with one last word of caution and that, that involves meridian flips. Typically with this type of procedure, I do, 
I do this either on one side of a meridian flip or on the other side of a meridian flip. I don't like to shoot an object that's going to do a meridian flip. And that, the reason for that, obviously, is because we've got the, the main imaging camera, which is right here, covered, okay? It's not going to be able to do a meridian flip because it'll basically get to the other side. Then it'll be like, I can't see any stars. I can't see any stars. And it just, it won't ever finish. So typically I do, I do my plans such that I do an object on one side of the meridian flip half the night and then another object on the other side of the meridian flip the other half of the night, you know, and I do let it kind of go back past it a little ways. And you, you can turn off the meridian flip in the ASI Air Plus as well. You just need to make sure your thing doesn't crash itself throughout the night. But that's kind of how I treat the whole meridian flip thing. Now, I suppose that if you had, you could actually get two guide scopes and have one that actually kind of is imaging and that is also used as a, almost like a dedicated plate solver. And then I suppose you could actually do a meridian flip. You'd want to make sure that that guide scope could be sighted up to the exact center of your main DSLR. But you know, hey, it works. You know, for now it's a workaround, but you know, it this does work in getting a camera that's not designed to work with the ASI Air Plus, simply because ZW hasn't come out with the drivers for it yet. All right, so I want to show you something here quick. It, you know, and ZWO, if you're watching, this could solve so many issues with using other cameras that you haven't supported yet. See this little port right here? It's a tiny little two and a half millimeter headphone jack, okay? This is supposed to be an intervalometer port. This has been here since version one, three years now, and it still does absolutely nothing, okay? And I know there's a couple cameras out there that on CWS website, it says that you have to have this hooked up to your, I think it's a couple versions of the Nikon camera, but I know friends who have those cameras and I've asked them, I was like, look, if you disconnect that and you just use the USB, their camera still works. So this thing is doing absolutely nothing. Okay, so, you know, could we actually have this thing a functioning port, you know, give us an interface that we can use this with, you know, that's, that's my Christmas wish list. <laughs> Hopefully this video was helpful to you. As I know, it took me a little while to figure all of this out. Give me a like and subscribe if it was. And if it wasn't, give me a thumbs down, right? And uh, keep shooting, folks.